Hey everybody and welcome back to The Breakdown. Uh, it's so great to have all of you here. Um, whether you're listening, I pray that you're driving safely. And if you're watching this, then that's awesome. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name's Kyle. I'm the video director here. And uh, we know that it's been a while since the last time that we've done a breakdown episode. So we're actually doing these series by series now. So the next one will be about six to seven weeks. So um, we've got a lot of Not stuff to talk about today. six to seven weeks long. Right. We'll have another. In- <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this is Eric. <laughs> hey, everybody. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Man, we had a good series, too. This was a good one. I was telling Erica last night that I was sad that this first five weeks was over. Um, really, really loved. Six weeks, actually, considering, you know, we started with the third. But it was mm-hmm. really good. I, I mean, man. I felt like I was preaching to myself most of these weeks. I mean, you could just, it was raw, it was honest, it was, you know, the emotion, you didn't have to find a way to convey emotion because it was just so real. So Mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was really good. I like this series. Yeah. Yeah. So man, um, that's a good lead way into our first question here. So throughout this series, we were continually heard to pack different traits, like the, it's called our devotion book is wisdom from the one who made the road. Yeah. So it's like we're taking wisdom with us. It's not something that we suddenly have along the way. It's something that we want to pack ahead of time. Right. So um, we talked about five different traits, being teachable, righteous, humble, self-controlled, and forgiving. So how can I check for these different traits in my own life? I think... Um I think one of the ways to do that is you have to take each one individually. They don't come as like, you know, like those little, um, it's, not, it's not something that comes in a gift set, you know, where you get, you know, your spoon, your fork, and your knife. You don't get a set of those. You have to, you have to cultivate each one. Think of it more like a garden. I would say uh, you're looking at it, you're like, okay, I'm going to plant this here. I'm going to be intentional about this here. And you weed and you care for that, but you also move on and you tend and care for these different things in your life. You can't just be like, well, I checked on the garden and it's all good. No, you got to make sure everything's getting the right amount of attention because we're so unique individually, right? So for what what takes a lot of cultivating in my life, let's say um, self-control. It's something I've got to work on a lot. But there's other things that come more naturally. I grow those more naturally. Um, it's in my nature to, uh, for that to grow more naturally. So, you know, even looking at it, I would say um, self-control is, is something I, I have to really cultivate. I got to weed that a lot, make sure it gets the right amount of water. I've really got to work on that. Whereas I do believe myself to be a very forgiving person. I do forgive people. I do forgive and move on. It's not easy, but it does come about a little easier for me. So I would say, you know, in my life, I know where I need to work, but I also want to make sure I don't neglect those. Pay attention to each one. Give them intentional time, and it will bless the harvest of righteousness in your life. Mm. Oh, man, I like that. Yeah, that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. And I, uh, it was some devotion. I think it was one I actually did this morning. Um, I did like the U version, like Bible. They have like a little story that they do yeah. every, every day, and uh, something about how it was God cares about your character, not your comfort. Right. And I was like, oh man, that's like series was called the content of our character. So yeah. hey, that fits yeah. right in. That what wasn't that in the wisdom book? Was that one from the wisdom book? Could have been. It could have been because yeah. I, I th- I'm like, wait a minute. I think that might have been either today's or something. I don't know. Sure. But yeah, I mean, that is, oh, if comfort was the goal, then I, no, I'm not going to dive into yeah. that. <laughs> Comfort's not the goal, right? right? I, I mean, uh, transformation is, and we are to be crucified with Christ, mm-hmm. which is always uncomfortable. And um, so we are to let those things in us that come so naturally, a lot of those have to die away. And new life has to come. Well, it's painful to go through the dying of part of who you are. There's things about me that I liked that had to die, and that's lame. But it better be lame. I better embrace that and go through that than to be one of the people who God looks at and says, depart, me, depart from me, I never knew you. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's where it gets real serious. Yeah, that is a scary verse. And, and we have sure. to look at it and say, you know, when, when they say, didn't we prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, heal in your name, and God says, I didn't know you. 
you did all this stuff, but you never were in relationship mm -hmm. with me. So I think that's the kind of the, the crux of it, right, is being in that relationship. And what, what it does is it redefines comfort. We find ourselves comfortable when we're closest to our Heavenly Father, walking in relationship with Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit, we begin to develop a natural sense of peace and comfort there, though our circumstances can be very uncomfortable. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. good stuff. So um, how often should we check for these traits in our lives? We know that, like, I, like how you had just said, that there are some like forgiving comes a little more naturally to you, but uh -huh. self-control is something that you struggle with. So how often is it important to check for these different traits? Like how am I doing in each area? So I'm going to hold the garden analogy because I prayed before I came in here like, God, give me the right words. I, I didn't even have the garden analogy in my mind, so I'm going to hold that. A garden is something you tend to daily and work on weekly. You, you tend it. You make sure certain things are in place. But you tend it, and maybe that's just a check-in, daily. But you work on it pretty, pretty much like once a week, I would say. You go in, you really weed it, make sure it's all good. Now, I'm not a green thumb. I don't know what I'm doing in a garden really well, so I could be wrong on this. But what I would say in that is that we want to tend to these things. I think we should be checking in on it because these things, it's like um, when, we, when we talked about it, we had that big backpack, that big um, day bag, not day bag, uh, long haul hiking, hiking bag. backpack. And... Um, and when you look at it, it's like if you packed up your camp every night, you would ch make sure every day that everything's in there. You may not clean it all out real good and air everything out real good. You may just get it packed and get on the road. But you, you take an inventory. I think a daily inventory is essential in the Christian life. That's why devotions, being in the Word of God, but then being quiet with the Lord and, and not doing all the talking super important because what we do is we're tending to the things that matter and quite often the Spirit of God will check us. If we're looking through this list of things um, and maybe doing something in our own righteousness and God's like, hey, you're getting a lot of praise and glory for this and I'm not, um, maybe it's time to work on that a little, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, let God convict us, but I think these require daily um, attention and, and just making sure they're there. It, if they're not there, you can't use them. Mm. So that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I'm like, there is like, it is so important to be in the word of God every single day. Yep. And I think I've heard the analogy from you before of like getting married and then like, hey, how's your, how's your relationship with your wife doing? Like, I don't know, I haven't seen her in a few months. Right, <laughs> right, and you're like, well, that's not a very good marriage. Right. I don't know, we don't talk. Is that how marriage <laughs> should work? So yeah, I, I think that's, that's the best way to look at it yeah. is if we are the bride of Christ and Christ is the, um, and the bridegroom, then what we have to look at is, is asking ourselves, okay, in, in this relationship, Am I in relationship? Am I walking with, with, my, with my spouse? And Jesus Christ is known as the Word of God. So in the Scriptures, in the Scriptures, when we, when we look at the Word, it is a way of being in relationship with Jesus. It's not the only way. There is prayer. There is, um, like, I think the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines of silence and um, prayer and, and honestly fixing our eyes on him and worship and different things. So the word of God is a critical part to that. And um, it's, it's the language we speak. Yeah. 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 So um, we started off the series with just kind of an intro to it, an intro to the book of Proverbs. And yeah. um, what you had said was that, like, well, what what is a proverb exactly? And I think maybe yeah. we should like touch back on that for a second too. And yeah. some of the things that you had said is like, it's not it's not a life hack. <laughs> and there 
there's the book of Proverbs in the Bible, but the word proverb is actually kind of general. It's not, would you say it's not necessarily like it came from the Bible? No. There's like Chinese proverbs oh, and stuff, sure. and I've heard some. And Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, one of the books I love, and if you've never read it, I'd read Sun Tzu's Art of War. Fantastic. But he has Isn't some it cool like proverbs. that thick? No, I oh. mean, <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. If it is, then I read the wrong Art of War. But, oh, man. Um, no, but there's... Pocket edition. Yeah, I get the pocket edition, the <laughs> spark notes of it. <laughs> the art of war-ish. <laughs> um, so what I would say is there's some proverbs in there that um, that are really good. And they just, they they teach you things. I'm trying to pull one up from memory right now. Um, because what he does is he gives these little proverbs at times that tell you, you know, it's it's better, and I'm going to totally butcher the quote, but it's better to use the enemy as the enemy comes at you, use their force against them, right? Mm-hmm. So, so take all their force and find a weakness where you can pivot their energy and literally cause them to strike themselves, right? Mm-hmm. That, that kind of proverb, that idea, whenever I'm involved in conflict, And there's stuff coming at me. What I want to do is match energy with energy, right? And you giggle. Well, it's easy to. Yeah, Yeah. and and that's my way. I'm like, okay, we're going to fight. I'm going to get as big as I can and as forceful as I can. And, And in some ways, what he's saying is get small and get nimble so that they move past and now their flank is exposed. Mm hmm. Use their energy, use their anger, whatever, to, to pivot that. It's a proverb, right? And I think it's, in, in a way, you could say, like, that's a life hack. But it's saying, don't give in to all these craven emotions and desire. I mean, fight or flight is the most base human instinct. Don't just rise up. Be smart. And I think Proverbs has that, but it's not. Proverbs aren't just in Scripture, as you said. Mm. Uh, they're, they're a great part of um, God's wisdom poured out through different people throughout the ages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one thing that I had written down from that first message of yours was that um, Proverbs are also like there's, there's riddles in there. Mm-hmm. And they're to whet your appetite to mm-hmm. dig for the deeper truth. Yeah. Not necessarily like the proverb right here is like, yes, that's it. It's like, no, that gets you to... yeah get deeper into into the word and mm-hmm. yeah no i agree and you said it really well i mean there's not much more to point on in that some of those riddles make you go well that's what it says on the surface but what is it what is it really causing me to want i want to know the answer to that question that's too easy mm. right so what if i look underneath a little and spend some time mining the word of God to speak truth into that, letting scripture interpret scripture. And what we find is scripture always speaks univocally with one voice um, in terms of truth. And it's amazing how when, when a riddle, a proverb that's a riddle kind of causes you to dig what you often, I've, here's the thing, I have universally, for me personally, when I've had a riddle or something in scripture where I've had to go back and begin to dig into it, I've always found it reveals a trait of the person of Jesus Christ. Mm. The deeper truth always has revealed something true of who Jesus revealed himself to be. And Jesus, the fullest revelation of the Father, so I've learned something true of God by digging in. It's just awesome. Yeah. 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 So here was the, actually the scripture from Proverbs that you opened with. So um, skipping the first verse, it says the Proverbs, Solomon, son of King, son of David, King of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive, to receive instruction and in wise dealing and righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in, under, in, in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so far going through Proverbs, I hear a lot of like mocker versus wise, fool versus wise. Mm-hmm. It's like every single proverb there is like this contrast. Mm-hmm. I guess, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? I think it's just important because it's telling you there's no riding the fence, right? There's no moderate in this. You're, you're going to be pursuing the path of the fool or pursuing the path of the wise, 
right? You're going to be pursuing the path of the one who is a learner, or you're going to pursue the path of the one who's a mocker. And what it does is it says, you can't have it both ways. You've got to make a choice. And choices like that, I can't be on a diet one day a week or 22 hours a day. Because if I eat good 22 hours a day and then shovel 4,500 calories of fat, salt, and sugar into my body in that two-hour span, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wreck what I did the other time. And, and what Proverbs does in these contrasts, it juxtaposes the two different people and it says, no, no, you've got to understand that this is a disciplined self-control. This is a disciplined effort that will require 24 hours a day, seven day a week, 365 days a year of just discipline, right? Just discipline, knowing that I'm going to choose the path of the righteous. I'm going to be humble and teachable. I'm going to be a learner. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to scoff. I'm not going to mock. I'm not going to ignore wisdom. I'm going to start, I mean, that opening scripture says, this is what it takes to have this. So here's your first thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what I do is I live, I try to live under the fear of God so that, um, because when I live under the fear of God, it's like, how do you drive when you know there's, uh, you're using Waze and it says there's a cop half mile ahead? You adjust your speed, unless you're a police officer, then I'm always doing the speed limit. But, um, but you look on it, it says there's a cop a half mile ahead, right? There's a speed trap. You change your speed a little. Why? Because you're living in fear, and it's a healthy fear of that authority figure. Mm. Well, as a Christian, if I live in the fear of the Lord, I'm going to pursue wisdom because the fear of God, so that's something that says, I am not God, he is. How can I learn to live in the fear of God that's healthy? I think really for you and I, it's a pretty simple equation. We have to look at it and say, okay, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning, I have to start at the very beginning. I do not know why I'm about to sing Julie Andrews and Sound of Music, but you have <laughs> right. to start at the very, oh, you don't know that? Start oh, I'm at sure the I very know, beginning. But Anyways. It's like where um, we started this yeah, series right? in your Sound of Music. Right, right yeah, totally Sound of Music. <laughs> but, um, but you start at the beginning and you put yourself in the right posture. He is God, we are not, so we're going to trust that he sees bigger and what he desires to do is better than what we are impulsed to do. Mm. So if I fear God, I'm going to pursue a path of being disciplined to follow, learn, and obey. If I don't fear God, it sounds, I don't know how to say it in a way that's not really, it feels crude, but it's really true, and it's a heart posture that, that if, if we don't fear God, we're giving the finger and doing whatever we want. And it sounds rude to say, and you're like, oh, I would never do that. But when you choose not to fear God and you're a mocker who, who just scoffs at everything that wisdom teaches, or you're a fool who ignores wisdom, what you're doing is that. Because it says, I don't fear God. I mean, go back to the driving analogy. There's a cop a half mile ahead. He doesn't care if I'm doing 78 and a 65. I'm pretty sure he does. And you're going to get a Christmas tree driving behind you with all the pretty lights pulling you over. And you're like, what, what happened? Well, you didn't realize that those rules are not just for everybody else. They're for you. These are universals. And I don't mean to use that term of giving the finger crudely, but there's, a, there's, there's an emotional. So it's like a heart posture. Like a heart that. posture. That's it. Yeah. There's this emotional, spiritual posture in it. And, and we don't see ourselves as um, arrogant and disorderly people. And I think when that, that symbol of what I said, when, when, when you're giving the finger and just doing it, it is an arrogant and disorderly way to live. But wisdom says, fear the Lord and follow his commands. And listen, be in the word of God. Let it, let it transform you into Jesus' image, not try to justify your sin to transform Jesus into yours. Mm. And the church is a cultural anomaly is what you'd said in there too. Yeah. It is. Oh, absolutely. We are supposed to be very countercultural. We are oh, a yeah. separate culture within the wider culture. I agree. And I think yeah. it's going to get harder and harder to be a separate culture. And people are going to want more and more of um, the world's ethic in here. And quite honestly, so you have to I be will. Be careful of. Not only be careful, but you have to, um, in wisdom and in humility, you have to be willing 
to stand up and put the shield wall up Definitely. and say, you can't come in and redefine our biblical orthodoxy, huge, our understanding of human worth from womb, conception, to the end of life. I'm telling you, church, we better have our eye on this one. It's a big deal. Um, human life matters, and it's, why? Because you're created in the image of God, and to live in the fear of the Lord is to look back at Scripture and says, like, why, when the very first murder, when Cain murdered Abel, his blood cried out from the ground. I will tell you, we've got to be people who understand that that is still the ethic. God, it matters. It's still the blood of Christ that was shed for us that saves us from sin. It's so important. So when I look at this and go, we have to be countercultural, being countercultural isn't this um, trendy term that kind of makes us, you know, uh, avant garde or, or kind of out on the cutting edge, you know, or, or in any way woke to some cultural movement. It's going to be the same thing it always has been a call to obedience to what God called us and literally made us to be in relationship with him. Holy, which means set apart from this world. We're going to be countercultural. And, and for me, fighting to do that is really hard. Mm. But it's not really hard. It's how do I do it in a self-controlled, gracious way that doesn't go out and declare war on the world because Jesus loves the world. He died to save the world. So I can't hate them and be at war with them, but I have to stand faithfully on the grounds of orthodoxy and our practice based on our orthodoxy must reflect the truth of Scripture. Yeah. Well that was, said. That was, yeah. That, was a, that was a big. Yeah. But that, yeah, that's where we are. So the first trait that we started out the series with after the intro was teachable. Yeah. And I think this is definitely a trait that's super important. Yeah. And when I think of teachable, I think of the, the words of Jesus where he says, unless you become like a little child, you will, you will never see the kingdom of God. Yeah. And he was talking to... He was talking to was the talking disciples. To the disciples. And he brought a child in. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because... Um, Oh man, I mean, every, I don't know, like every word Jesus spoke was just like something I, I don't know, that's why I love the Gospels so much yeah. is because all of his parables are so, generally, they're easy to understand, Yeah, but they go so much deeper. Yes, and like yesterday's, the kingdom of heaven is like. Oh yeah. We'll, I mean, that we'll, one. Yeah, we'll okay, get to that we'll get one. To that. Yeah. I won't jump ahead. All right, yeah. I don't want to get clapped back no. by Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, do you, do you have any um, thoughts, I guess, when the word teachable comes yes. to mind then? I super duper have thoughts on it because um, two things. We can never, and this relates to humility too, it is so important to be, to be in the posture of always learning. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most transformative moments of my life was when we took Josh, our oldest, to Liberty University to visit the campus. When we got there, we went to convocation, and that is a weekly, uh, I think they have it two or three times a week. That's a word I've never meet, heard before. Yeah, um, they meet in this huge uh, kind of superdome thing that they have, and uh, they meet up there in this place, 10,000 students, they open with worship, and then they bring in different speakers. So one of their speakers was like Melania Trump, she came in. She talked about what it was like to be an immigrant and different things. And the first lady, I mean, kind of an interesting American dream life, sure. right? And then they had Bernie come. You remember Bernie, like bundled like Bernie with his big oh, homemade yeah, mittens? Yeah. Like they had Bernie Sanders come. And he came and talked on the things he values. And I love it because um, I would say at Liberty, more people identify with Melania than they do Bernie, right? Hey, there's not a ton of socialism at Liberty. Um, I'm sure there's pockets of it, but here's what I loved. When we were there, they were saying, we bring all sides so the students don't just get one angle, which being teachable means I'm willing to hear the things I don't necessarily agree with and wrestle with them. And here's how it came to life in, my, in, in that moment. I literally, I, I like had tears running down my cheeks because I knew at that moment my son was going to go there. I knew it. Dr. Cornell West, um, Google him. A dude's got awesome hair. He's, he, I think he was in The Matrix. Um, oh, he's wow. one of the wise old guys. You know, he's, he's awesome. It's been a long time since um, I've seen him. I don't agree with him politically, uh, but, but, he's, but he's a Christian 
Uh, so I believe uh, I agree with him on the deepest and most important thing. He is um, he's a socialist, and he believes in socialism really as a justice route. Everybody gets the same thing. And I'm like, okay, fine. And then Dr. Robert George. Now, both of these men, Robert George is at Princeton, uh, uh, Dr. West is at Harvard, I believe, or Yale. Um, so big Ivy League, big brain people. They are best of friends. Robert George is a capitalist. And um, West is a socialist. They are dear friends. They talk multiple times a week. They do these conversations. And in front of 10,000 people, they debated capitalism or socialism. And they did it really well. And the way they did it is they talked first about um, the value of human life. They started at the same place, the value of each life because they're created in the image of God. I was like, awesome. But then the one that killed me, because Robert George, I mean, I just, I loved what he was saying. Of course I did, right? I, I, think, I think he's right. So it was easy to listen to him. But Cornell West said the thing that changed my life. And he said this, there is the, the most important thing you can have is intellectual humility, which is the ability to go into a conversation without having your beliefs welded shut, but come in willing to learn, willing to hear, and re ready to know that you don't know it all. So maybe they have something to contribute from their broken viewpoint, they can contribute truth, and it was happening in real time in my life in that place. And I just sat there and he said, intellectual humility says, I don't know it all and I can always learn. It's the pursuit, not just of knowledge, but it's the pursuit of truth. And I can learn. And intellectual humility means I come into a conversation believing what I believe, but also willing to moderate some of these things to be, well, correct. And I think that's an important reality. Because in our modern day and age, day and age um, a guy who has a podcast I listen to, he compared uh, the political nature of America, the far right and the far left. He said, if America's a road, the far right and the far left are the gutters. And somewhere in between there is the roadway for safe passage. And we can't be fused to these hard ideals. And, and I think it's important because Dr. West talked about intellectual humility and he says, I listen, I try to learn. I'm not saying I have it right. I'm saying based on what I've learned so far, this is my belief. But I'm always willing to moderate that around truth. If we approach scripture with intellectual humility, we will begin to put to death justifications for sin that God doesn't make, justifications for attitudes and heart motivations that God doesn't accept, and we will begin to be transformed. But when we come to God and we say, first of all, God, God is of this political party, he likes America best, or he likes Israel best, or he likes Russia best, or he's for the underground Chinese church, not the American church, and we come with these fixed ideals, what we end up doing is we tell God, this is what we'll believe about you. Now validate me. I wanted to say something yeah. for a second. This reminds me of the verse in Joshua, yeah. where Joshua encounters the, um, the angel of the army of the Lord, mm -hmm. and he's in his path, and Joshua comes up to him, and he's like, are you for us, or are you for the other side? And yeah. he said, I'm for neither. I am for, I'm like the commander of the armies of the kingdom yeah. of God, and like Joshua so just good, falls Kyle. before him. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. That's the perfect verse, and that's what I would say. Like, do I love America with my whole heart? I love this nation. I feel blessed to be born here and raised here, and to have experienced. I think I'm at 44 of the 50 states I've made it to. What up? I'm coming for you, Idaho. But um, but like, I I feel blessed to be a part of this. But I will tell you this: God loves America no more then he loves Uganda or Peru or Brazil. It doesn't matter. God, God didn't draw borders. You know, that, that's a man-made thing. And though I love our nation, I think it's, it's a wonderful and, and beautiful place. I do think this, nationalism of any kind can easily usurp Christianity because, well, I'm this you know, and it's like, okay, I get it. And, um, and if called to, I would fight for this country. I would do what I have to do 
to preserve and protect the Constitution. I love our country, but the reality is it can't be my first love. I had to learn that. I had to learn that. I come from a military family. My granddad fought in World War II in the Navy. My dad in, World, in Vietnam in the Navy. And there's a rich military tradition. And, and I'll be honest, like you can, you can really kind of get into a weird warped thing of, of worship that isn't biblical. So when you talk about um, Joshua, who, remember this, they were the people of God, the, the chosen ones, Israel, getting ready to take the land he promised them. And when Joshua says, it's such a good verse, Kyle, that you brought this up. When Joshua says, are you for us or against us? And he says, neither. We need, that is your teaching moment right now. Because that is still true. Is God for us or against us? Neither. He is for the blood of Jesus Christ atoning for the sin of everybody and them receiving it. Everyone's sin is forgiven under Christ. The question is, will they receive the forgiveness? Will they accept it? That's, that's where it comes down to. So our mission as a church can never be overtly political because our mission is far greater than politics. It's greater than a nation. It is the cornerstone of all history. So being teachable means I had to unlearn some things that I loved. But it doesn't mean, I, I mean, I'm no less American but I am much more Orthodox Christian, and I love that. Mm. I love that, and it doesn't take away the fact that every year from spring till the end of fall, there's an American flag hanging outside my house. Why? I'm thankful for this nation, but the reality is I had to learn something about balance, and I think that's really kind of cool because uh, what God is for if, I mean, fear of God here, right? If, if we fear God, we'll recognize that what God is for may be different than what we're for. Mm. Well, that gets uncomfortable unless you're willing to listen and wisely apply that to your life and say, okay, I'm not going to get my love of country ahead of my love of Jesus. Because that can become an idol in your oh, life. Super duper. Oh, Absolutely. And I think, you know, you want to say, and rightly so, because it's a good country, but no, it's never right. So um, that idea of intellectual humility, being able to come to a conversation without the box of information welded shut and what you believe inside can never be altered. This is not a time capsule. We are not God. Um, I said it the other day in a teaching, how widely and uh, profoundly ignorant I am on most topics. So of course I should approach every conversation with intellectual humility mm. because there's so much I don't know. There's a book um, I'm reading too and I actually got my dad for Christmas. It's um, Dr. Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. Mm. And while it's like you, you read a book and you don't agree with everything in it, he has a lot of really good just general ideas. And mm -hmm. one of his rules is assume everybody you're speaking with knows something that you don't. Oh, oh, that, <laughs> that right there. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And then if I might quote Matt Chandler too, because um, you'd brought him up in your message yesterday, mm -hmm. was that he'd said, I think, something back in early winter that Jesus would not be owned. Like if Jesus was here today, he's not going to be owned by a particular party. Like he oh, said, like man. the left would get frustrated about like his sexual ethic and then the right would get frustrated when he's telling parables like the good socialist. I'm just waiting for the internet to catch fire. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're dead on. So when you quoted him, I was no, just like, oh, man. I, I love Chandler because, because he's right in so many ways. And I appreciate him. I like that he yells. I think he gets mad and he just shouts and he's all shrieky and awesome. But I, I, love, I love his teaching because I think he's orthodox. I think he has a correct um, understanding of Scripture. And he's growing in his pastoral voice and leadership, and I think he leads well, but, um, but it's so very true. So to unpack what, you, I, what we just talked about, yes, everybody you talk to can teach you something um, wonderful. Erica shared something with me. I know she heard it, and it's something that I was so convicted on. This is such a good place to talk about um, uh, being teachable. We were talking with a new uh, young family, and you know me, I like to tell stories. I've had a lot of life experiences going places, and if I'm interesting, maybe they'll want to talk more. So I'll tell stories and get people to attach. You've probably seen this, right? Um, it's just how I am in relationship. Uh, and Erica shared with me, 
the idea of being interested, not interesting. Hmm. Because interesting is self-serving and self-aggrandizing. Interested puts them in the spotlight. And I realized, I, I'm like, oh man, it was the biggest conviction of humility I've had in a long time because I love being interesting. And I'm not always interested, which tells me what? I don't think you always have something to teach me, but I could tell you about me. Aren't I great? And it was just a revelation of my heart posture. It was like a really bright light in a really dirty corner. And I was like, oh, I'm going to sweep that up because it was really bad, right? Yeah. And, and that's where I felt, Kyle. Like, I think it's important. And it's a change of posture. And here's the thing. I've been working on it for three weeks now, and I'm terrible at it. I only want to be interesting. It is ground into me because I want to be first. I want to be heard. I want to be seen, all this stuff. And learning that idea that you shared, that everybody you meet has something to teach you, the only way I'm going to learn that is if I shut up. It's really hard to do when you think you're interesting or something. It's, it's an arrogance, and God's dealing with it. And I'm like, oh, this is miserable, but it's wonderful. And I love that I have a wife who will speak that kind of truth into my life. Stings, but um, she's fearless. And she, you know, I wouldn't say she's fearless. She's courageous. And she's willing to see me get angry and be offended in order that I hear truth. And I love that about her. And I love that she shared that with me. And I have something that I believe will be a hallmark work in my life through 2021 of me changing my posture to being interested, not just interesting. So teachable, right? What is teachable? It means that I have intellectual humility. I'm not God. I don't know it all. So maybe there is something for you to teach me, even if I disagree with you on multiple fronts. On multiple fronts. So I can take the truth of what somebody said that I don't like and I can still apply it. Why? Because they may have information and understanding in a specific area that is true. That is true. So I've learned things from atheists. I just haven't learned anything about God from atheists. <laughs> right? Right. And, and their concept and their fundamental premise of that is wrong. But it doesn't mean it's, that they're wrong on everything. They're not wrong on everything. Mm -hmm. I just disagree with their understanding of theism. Okay, you're an atheist. I don't need, I don't want or need to know all your justifications, but I've read them because I want to know why I believe what I believe. And when I go in open like this, it, at first it was nerve-wracking until I realized the wonder of truth, Right? and the biblical witness, and the thousands of years, multiple authors, con con all condensed down to really one message, that God loved you and the proof of it is Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. It all comes down to one story. It's all interconnected. I love that. So I can go into things I disagree with, and I can listen, and I can also refute what I disagree with from there. Mm-hmm. From there. So in this church, we will never undermine Scripture in any way. It's authoritative, and, um, and it can change deeply held beliefs based on truth, not just feeling. And as a person who's very much feeling-oriented, I just got to be careful not to let your feelings redefine truth. Mm. So being teachable is about intellectual humility and recognizing you're a person, you're a sponge. And if all you're doing is squeezing out something for people to hear, you're never going to actually take anything new and wonderful in. Hmm. Yeah. I heard just about every single trait from the series in that, too. Oh, you so, did? Okay, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, and especially humility, too, because it's always coming back to being teachable is intellectual hum humility. Yep. So let's swing back around to humility if okay. we have time left over from this. But let's move on to righteous. And this yep. was the one that... Matt taught on. Did a great and job. And he, he did a really good job on this one. And I think the biggest note I have on this is that our righteousness, we don't have. We do not have any righteousness of our own that we produce. There is nothing that we do that makes us righteous. All of our righteousness is imparted unto us 
when we put our faith in Christ and we repent of the sin in our life. Yes. So that's absolutely 100% true. Yeah. And um, one of the things, I guess I had a small question to begin with first. Um, a distinction between blameless and righteous because it says that Noah was a blameless man in Genesis. Is there, is there any sort of like distinction between those two words hmm. and what they mean or? Oh, man. I super wish my Hebrew professor were here. Oh, man. I'm sure he could, he could unpack that. Uh, this is, yeah, I would have to say, um, I don't know. It's a great question. What's the difference between righteous and blameless? Um, so I'm going to take a brief hack at it. Mm. And if I'm, I'm listening, not, I'm going to look for a little no, thing about Bible if too. If I'm not right, um, then I'm not right. Mm. But so they would take um, a sheep. They would take a sheep on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, or a goat, um, or in any of the sacrifices, and a blameless, spotless sheep, and they would put it to death, right? Mm. But, but the, the animal was blameless. So the animal being blameless means it had willfully committed no wrong. It wasn't guilty of the sins of the people sacrificing it, and it stood on behalf of their sin. It was, an, it was kind of like it bore the guilt. Uh, something blameless took the, the blame of something willfully guilty. Um, so blameless, in my mind, has this idea of um, no willful wrong being present, which is different than righteousness because if, if sin, excuse me, is not what you do, but it's who you are, Apart from Christ, we have a sinful nature. If that's the reality, then what I would say is righteousness is not something we can attain because there is willful sin and then there is uh, the incidental thing, the things we didn't mean to do, didn't want to do, but it was sin, right? You, I, I've made jokes or comments before because I want to make people laugh and I've incidentally hurt people's feelings, you're like, yes, this happens, right? <laughs> um, but the reality for me is, Kyle, I look at that and I'm going, okay, that's not a willful thing. I don't, I, my intention wasn't to hurt. I was trying to have fun, but, but sometimes I've hurt people. That is um, a sin of omission, not a sin of commission. I didn't commit that sin willfully against the will of God. It was, it was a brokenness in me, right? I think what we can say about Noah is him being blameless would say that he always desired to honor God. Mm. And to the best of his ability, he lived blamelessly, but he was not righteous. Mm. He wasn't righteous, but he was blameless, which means he, he lived a life intending to honor God in all that he did. And he never sought to defile himself or or do wrong in the eyes of God, mm. which is really important. But, but the distinction is righteousness is something given to us, or as you said, it was, it's imparted unto us from Jesus Christ. We are given the righteousness of Christ. So if I took this real quick and I said, hey, um, I want you to take this vest and that's yours and you put it on, you've Im like I've imparted to you that, right? And that's very much what we do. We take Christ's righteousness and it's put onto us so that when people see me or when God sees me, he doesn't see the broken, sinful Eric. What does he see? I am cloaked in Christ. Which, which makes the word of God all the more important because I think it was Luther who said, scriptures are the very garments that Christ wears. So that's why we wrap ourselves in the word. I mean, this is all so interconnected and wonderful. So yeah, that's where I would, I would go back on righteousness and just say again, Matt, did, if you haven't listened to that teaching, go listen yeah, to it. It's definitely. remarkably good. But it's really fun to realize righteousness, it's not what you do. Even your motivations are probably seeded with personal desire to look a certain way. Even the best of intentions have hidden motivations in us because we know we just, 
we know we're going to benefit somehow. It's very rare that we see someone do something selfless, self-defacing, and self-sacrificing to obey God because they get no fringe benefit from it. Righteousness is not something we do. It's who we are in Christ, period. Right. Praise God for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think of his story that he told in there. It was in the beginning of his message when he was in school and some money that he earned, he used to purchase like goats and sheep or certain things for people in a faraway country. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't want to misquote him, so I'm being general. No, you're right. That's right. Um, and he said that like towards the end of the message, he revealed that like he would do it and he'd kind of look back and see who noticed him. Yeah. And I took away this thing about living a double life. Mm-hmm. And this goes back to the first thing I said about God cares about our character, not our comfort. He wants us to, we're not, we don't put on this facade around other people. If we're living lives very differently from being who, who you see me as, who everybody else see me as, and then I go home and I'm something completely different, then that's mm-hmm. something that's something God cares about so, so much, and he wants to work that out of us. And I don't know, I just, I guess I didn't really finish that thought. Well, I think you but, did a good job. So let me ask this back at you. Why do you think the idea of a double life is so sour in your mind? Why, why does it just kind of rub you the wrong way? It's a good question. Um... I guess because it's, it's lying, and God hates lying too, and we're, we can only be one person, and we're supposed to be made into the image of Christ, and if that's not what's happening, then I'd say that's not a fruit of salvation. Okay, yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I think... Hmm. I, I think this is really important because, you know, the idea what Matt was saying is what I put forward um, and then I look back to make people make sure people saw me. Um, it, it says in the scripture, God detests hmm. our righteousness or our, our good works, good works. Yep. When, when we do them for personal gain, which means all the things you do to appear a certain way and you're not that, God detests it. Even the good you do is evil in the sight of God. Why? Because your true character, you're not, there's no humility in you. It's actually the, the opposite. Oh, you're, right. It's arrogant to think that I can put on this show and because I do so good with it and I, I give goats to farmers in faraway lands, that God's going to overlook the fact that my heart posture was to glorify myself. When we are called to glorify God, according to the Westminster Confession, and enjoy him forever, what we're doing when we do those good works that we want people to praise us for is, and, and we're kind of like, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, but go ahead, I'll, I'll take it. When we do that, what we're saying is, um, I want the world to be interested in me and it's okay if Jesus takes a secondary supportive role to mm. the interest in me. Yeah. That is abhorrent in the eyes of God. And our righteousness being rooted only in Christ means that our that even the good we do may it may not look the best for us in the eyes of the world and even and this is what i love and i when i say the bad things we do even the things we do that that don't appear the best that even i would even say like some of the things people would say that i've done that was a mistake where i know i was obeying god and the world would look and say that it still wasn't good god says no 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 that obedience costs you. Costly obedience matters in the Christian faith. And the world won't always clap. They won't always cheer. And they will not agree quite often with what you do. But do you believe that um, your appearance to the world is not God's number one priority? Mm-hmm. So when we... 
<laughs> when, we, when we live that way, what we, what we end up doing is we find that Jesus Christ lives into that promise in Scripture that he'll give beauty from ashes. He'll redeem even the broken things for his glory because it was always his righteousness covering a very broken life. And that broken life is being remade into the image of Jesus Christ. And so I look at that and I find a great deal of hope in the fact that the good deeds we did with bad motives, God can forgive those. I've had to pray for forgiveness for things too. Um, but at the same time, the, the good things we've done that's just known between us and God, that is a precious treasure like something that, that's an inside um, part of a close relationship between a husband and wife, that's a treasure between us, the bride, and Christ, the groom. Something mm -hmm. just between us. It's an intimacy that we share. And, um, and outside of that, it cheapens it. And that's why we, I value righteousness from Christ because it means everything I do is tinged with his righteousness. And his righteousness only shows more the more I recede. I mean, what's the scripture? I must decrease that he may increase, right? That's what we're doing. And eventually, I mean, my deepest hope, Kyle, um, is that we never have a pastor's wall here at the Foundry Church, that in the end, no one ever knows who planted this church. There will not be something like, you know, Pastor Eric planted it. I have my season here, and I'm going to get it and have fun and do all I can to preach the gospel and preach the word of God to the church, to grow it as best I can. But when I'm done, if I'm, if I'm, when I leave, if I leave, and it and nobody and everybody's like, well, Eric's not here, and I'm, I have completely failed, mm. and that's my desire. Like, how how can I one day not be known here? And how how many months would it take? And that's my goal. Months after I when I go, like when God retires me out of here, that's my plan. I don't ever plan to leave, but if He calls me away, or if He re you know if He retires me out of here into some other you know ministry uh, as a retiree, you know, old, little shorter, with gray hair and a walker, a um, little bit like Yoda there. But um, <laughs> how many? How many weeks would it take for me to walk in and no one know who I am? Because it was never about me. I hate that idea. But it is one of my central goals in mm. ministry. How can I be forgotten so that the only thing ever known here is Jesus Christ? I just think of the lyrics from some song. I can't actually name what it was, but I just hear... Um, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Mm -hmm. Christ be magnified in me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know those lyrics. I don't know the tune. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's just it. And it sounds so humble and, and nice for me to say it. I, do, I don't want it to be true. I don't want it to mm. be true. I want people to weep and be sad and grieve when I leave. Mm. I want that. But there has to be a greater obedience in me. Mm. And so that is what I die to. How am I not building something that Eric built? How am I obediently stepping out of any spotlight into the place that God um, has made as a gathering point for his body? And, and I think that's, that's part of it is I think I just came to know, dude, I know me. I, I know I'm not righteous. So it's not hard for me to think on the inside, this can't be about me. The problem is, on the outside, I just really want it to be. I want people to think I did good. I want people to think I'm good at what I do. I want people to like me. But if that's not God's goal, am I willing to obey that? And I'm having to work that out in real time. Not because I think I'm nearing retirement, death or otherwise, but the reality is, I know that tomorrow's not guaranteed. So if God were to take me today, would the church flounder? Am I setting it up obediently to glorify only Jesus Christ? That, when people say you're like as a visionary leader, that's my only vision. 
How can this be so much bigger than any persona, any person, any sense of identity outside of our identity in Christ? Your identity in Christ, my identity in Christ, how do I get to be a sheep in the flock of Christ, right? If he's the good shepherd, I am not the good shepherd. I'm not even a shepherd. I'm a sheep that wears a bell, right? I'm one of the ones that, um, that kind of get the sound of the bell as I walk, orients sheep to walk and follow. So I better be walking in the righteousness of Christ. Otherwise, I'm as dumb as a post and I'm gonna walk them all off a cliff. I better know that of myself. I better know that my righteousness is dangerous if it comes from me. But my righteousness in Christ, it is sure, it is steadfast, and in that one thing, I have no questions. I am righteous in Christ, but I also know I am at war with myself because I want people to think I'm better than I actually am. Mm. So we've got two more traits to cover here, and <laughs> um, the second to last one is self-controlled, and yeah. this, was the, uh, this was the story in 1 Samuel 25 of the story of Abigail, Nabal, and David. Mm-hmm. And this is when Nabal made a grave offense toward David, and then here David was coming back to pay him back for his disrespect. And then Abigail, realizing that, oh man, Nabal made a mistake, I gotta go fix this. Mm -hmm. And then she went out, she had like all these like breads and stuff baked, and then she went up to David's army, David and his army, before they were able to reach him, and she was able to, I guess I would say, Right that wrong. And get us where and, and David was pleased with it. Mm-hmm. And so where I guess does self control come into this aspect of this story then? So I think going back to the idea of that pause button that when we learned we could pause live TV, how freeing that was. Um, in the same way, self-control, when we realize that the Holy Spirit works within us to not be owned by the, it's called the amygdala hijack, when you go fight or flight and you get owned by that reptilian brain and you either shut down or you go hyperdrive. Um, David is a feeler. I mean, he's an artist, right? The dude wrote all the Psalms. He's just a very emotional. And so many times David wept or David was enraged. I mean, he was an emotional cat. And I love that about King David. I love that in his leadership. I think it's why people followed him. He, they knew he loved them. I think it's important. I think, you know, pastorally, like when even as I lead, um, You know, I don't get to know everybody in the church like I did when we were tiny. But the fact is that um, God has given me a love for the people of God, and my desire is for them. I don't want something from them. I want Jesus for them. And and I get that emotional attachment. And I think I love it with David because I I want to embody that in the healthy ways. But in the story of of Nabal um, and Abigail, David lost his temper and his mind. He was going to go kill an entire group of people, kill them, wipe out Nabal and his family from the face of the earth. He was not in a stable, healthy place. And what we learned in that story is that God put in his path, in in the Proverbs it says, wisdom prepares her table, and she calls out from the highest point of the city, come, you know, come and learn. What God did is he put a woman in David's path who put who gave him the option and the ability to pause. He still felt angry. He still felt resentful of what Nabal did. But all of a sudden, the pause took him out of that amygdala hijack and put him into a place where all of a sudden he could speak reasonably. And when we talk about self-control, we are dealing with our impulses our cravings, our desires, our emotions, all these things. And having a pause button over those things matters. It matters infinitely. So what we see in that story is that God, in wisdom, offers us a pause button. The question is, um, will we slow ourselves enough to let wisdom whisper louder than our hijack, louder than the noise in our head? Will we stop typing the email we so feel justified in sending or the text or lashing out online and typing a huge response on some weird political post, you know? Will we stop that in order to let wisdom whisper? Will we take a moment? And I love that because when you're dealing with your impulses, your emotions, your desires, and your cravings, not one of those 
comes from a healthy place. You know, I mean, how, how many times do you hear it? Well, I loved them, but I fell out of love. Yeah, the reality is that um, falling out of love can happen. But the fact is that love is not a feeling, it's a commitment. Thank God that God's love for us isn't based on how we make God feel. Because we've broken his heart time and time again. What, what God's love is rooted in is a commitment to us. And he puts something intrinsically valuable in us, his own image in us, and his commitment to us is our good and his glory. How do we live a life self-controlled that isn't owned by my cravings, my desires, my impulses, and my emotions? Self-control. Self-control is the ability to let wisdom push the pause button in our life and say, you know what, can I get back to you on that? Can I get back to you on that? I mean, here's one thing I know about you, Kyle. I know for you, your initial response to things is always a little more defensive, but you're very quick to see it differently. I love that about you. I love that. It's one of your great traits mm. because I know if I'm going to have to, like, if there's something I've got to talk about, like something I do or don't like, I know you're going to be initially a little defensive. But then when I leave, you'll chew on it. You'll think about it. You'll see it, and you'll be like, Okay, and you'll come back, and when we talk again, your posture is different. It's a great trait. It's a great trait. There's a self-control in that. The, the difference is, when you were younger, your reaction initially may have been much bigger, and you probably didn't feel like you need to reconcile things. But as you mature, that, that reaction's getting smaller initially, and your response is becoming ever more gracious. You're maturing in self-control. So, I mean, I, I see that in you, having worked with you for a few years, watching you come out of college and really take on this role. It's awesome. It's awesome. Self-control really matters. And when we grow in that, you may think nobody sees. I see. I see. I, I think it's awesome. So when, when I look at that, people should be able to say, like, I noticed, you know, and I'm not saying this of you anymore, we're moving mm -hmm. on, but yeah. I noticed you don't fly off the handle anymore. I notice that when you get mad, you take a minute and say, can I go walk around and just cool off? I've noticed, you know, this, this new response, and, and I'm less traumatized by your initial reaction. I've noticed that. When people start saying that, you can celebrate that God's faithfulness has grown in you self-control. Mm -hmm. And I would say that for you, like... Let those be benchmarks, mile markers on your road and on your journey. That if people are saying, hey, I've noticed that your initial response is, um, is not as big as it used to be. And you always seem to want to reconcile things to completion for growth. You want to close whatever wound is there, fix whatever's wrong, and move forward. Man, that's a really good thing. Mm. That's a good thing. And, and one of my goals is, you know, as I said, self-control is not my number one trait because I'm impulsive. I'm a super feeling-oriented person. So self-control doesn't always come naturally. You can see that in different appetites, you know? Like I, I have to be very cautious of what I eat because for me that can be an unhealthy habit. And like even this year I put, uh, I put a new thing in place just personally of what I'm going to do with some of my cravings. Oh, man, and I wasn't even prepping into the self-control aspect. And, um, and it's interesting because even as I've done that, um, my taste for, um, so it, it's a really small thing. But I was like, you know what? This year I'm going to change how I drink my coffee. I, I like kind of that bittery flavor. But I always had cream, maybe sugar in it and stuff. I'm like, I'm going to just go black coffee and just, I don't know, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. There were a few weeks where I was super sad about it in mid-January. I'm like, I wish I hadn't done that. And even my, my taste and cravings have changed. And some of the weird things that I, I wanted, I have a sweet tooth. I also have a savory tooth. I have a meat tooth. I have a lot <laughs> of different teeth on that. But um, what, even my cravings, I would, in the afternoon, I would want something sweet with a cup of sweet and more like rich coffee. And, um, and it's really curbed that. 
for me, and it's just a small thing, but there was an aspect of self-control in it that I didn't want to exercise that self-control. But I felt like for some reason it was important. For me, it's been a good discipline because when I didn't want it, I didn't even drink coffee. I'd be like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I realized, like, that's probably even healthy in terms of all the stimulant. For me, it's just not giving in to the thing I want, the impulse, the craving, the desire. Um, and, and I look at that, and I'm like, the work God did with me as a young man, um, you know, with some of those impulses and desires I had that come very naturally to young men and young women, um, desires for the opposite sex, and, and just, I like them. When I was younger, I looked and God convicted me and began transforming me in that. I'm so glad God did that because when I started something small like how I drink my coffee, I already knew the fruits of self-control for the last 23 years in the other area. And God's really blessed and, and guarded my heart. And I'm like, why wouldn't I trust him? So self-control is a battle against our impulses, our desires, our cravings, and our emotions. And the last thing, emotionally, um, the, it is so fascinating how uh, we are wired. Um, and it's why I believe, like, you know, coming to the table, uh, the sacrament of communion is so important because we have, um, we have literally a chemical, biological um, attachment to certain things. If your mom made you a certain food, it's why it's called comfort food because there is a small measure of what is known as oxytocin. It's the, it's the bonding hormone. When a mom has a new baby, the, the mom is flooded with oxytocin and you'll quite often hear a mom say, like just hours into knowing this child, I've, I love them more than I've loved anything. And the husband's like, <laughs> but but what happens is that oxytocin bonds her to that child and makes her commitment to that child greater than her commitment to herself. We actually, um, as men and women, we have an oxytocin release in much smaller quantities around the table. Food. So comfort food. If your mom made roast and potatoes and stuff, and maybe it wasn't your favorite childhood meal, but when you have roast and potatoes on a Sunday like she used to make when you were little, and you're like, man, this is so good. Why? Because you bonded to that. And so when you come and you have this certain food, it's why it comforts you. You're bonded to it in some strange way. How wonderful that when we're self-controlled, and we're obeying the Spirit of God and we can come to the communion table and we can hear the words we've heard so many times that it's actually this bonding moment between Christ and his church where we're going to have a little taste of juice and we're going to have a little piece of bread and it's going to be a small reminder and it's going to further release that oxytocin and bond us to Christ emotionally. I find that fascinating. Our commitment mm. to Christ grows even in the small gathering at the table. I love that kind of stuff because how much love does God give to us in, in just giving us that, the ability to practically emotionally bond with him at the table. And for if you grew up in the church, the sacrament of communion is very, um, you can feel the tradition of the church all the way back to Jesus instituting it. So it's really kind of cool. It's one of the reasons we say our table is open, but you never see a slack on how we approach communion. Why? Because I believe in the formality and the beauty and the liturgy and tradition of approaching the table well. Think of it like an airline pilot. Why do I appreciate a good airline pilot? He knows how to approach a landing well, right? He doesn't just like, whoo you can come out of the sky. He brings you in and sometimes it's like, boop, boop. And you're like, oh, wow, we landed, right? It should feel like that. We approach it well. We approach it intentionally so that when we engage in it, there is a memory of it for those who've been in the church and for those who are new to it, they go, oh, something's a little different about this. We're a little more formal. It feels more like a holiday meal at home than it does a foundry church service. Why? Because I, I think it's important that we bond to Jesus in that moment and that there's a taste. We taste and we experience something and we bond to it. So self-control really matters 
in all these areas. And if we don't control our cravings, our desires, our appetites, and allow ourselves to be bonded to God emotionally, we're going to give in to all these things and enjoy nothing, like nothing in life. If you give in to all your desires, you actually find yourself pretty miserable and um, incredibly unhealthy spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Definitely. Yeah. And so that leaves us with one more trait, and that's forgiving. And this message had two really good stories from the New Testament in it. And the first one was Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Mm -hmm. And the second one was the parable of the unmerciful servant. And both are... I just feel like everybody should hear them. Mm. Because you see both a... You see the very forgiving side of God because we, we see ourselves and like, oh man, like, yeah, I know I've, I've really messed up too. And like, yeah, I should be stoned. Mm -hmm. um, in a, in a logical analogy. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Have rocks thrown at you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah not, which I can't imagine would feel. No. Yeah. Um, and then the second one, with the parable of the unmerciful servant, we, we see the part of ourselves where it's like, oh man, I, I'm not seeing myself as like the, the, the fellow servant who was like, oh man, be patient to the other servants. Like I see myself as the unmerciful mm -hmm. servant. We're seeing how forgiving God is. And then we're looking at ourselves and being like, oh man, like when he, when he ends that with a verse of like, this is how your heavenly father will treat you if you do not forgive from your heart. Right. And it's like, I want to just read the whole scripture there too, but it's like, I kind of just recapped it. Yeah. And I don't know, just about for forgiveness, because that was, it was such a good message on that too, like the best stories on it. I don't know if you just had any thoughts or. I mean, I just go back to the point. Forgiveness as, um, as I read in a guy named Nikki who did the Alpha course, he says it so well. Forgiveness is a choice, but it's not optional. It's not optional. We have to freely forgive as Christ forgave us. We have to remember that he forgave people who weren't sorry, and so must we. But we also have to remember that forgiveness doesn't mean we allow people who've hurt us an all-access pass to our life. We have to have boundaries. We have to put boundaries up and maintain them around our own heart and emotions so that people can't come back in and wreak havoc on our lives. It's an important reality. I think, um, I think it's just the very gritty, hard, dirty work of being a Christian is forgiving people who have wronged you because you know if you've lived this life long, you've got people you have to forgive. Mm -hmm. You have people you have to forgive, people who've wronged you. It could be your very parents. For some people, they had abusive parents or neglectful parents. It could be... Um, it could be classmates who tormented you when you were young. It could be a teacher who called you stupid in front of the class. Um, I have one teacher I remember uh, from when I was in sixth grade who laughed at me when I wrote my answer on a math problem on the board. Um, I can still see his um, dark brown corduroy pants and little sweater vest and uh, man, I have to forgive that guy sometimes because when I think about when I feel insecure, when I feel stupid, which honestly, it's often, it's one of the ways the devil gets to me. I'm not an academic. I don't feel smart. Um, I like to read. I like information. But at the same time, I don't always retain it. So, you know, you just don't feel super bright and, um, and I can still hear his laugh. I can and so quickly just think, you know what? That dude's got to be in his 60s now. And I'm, I've peaked, you know, physically. I'm long past my prime, but uh, better than he is, I bet. You know, and that weird darkness comes out of me, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I have to forgive him in here. Because I can still hear his laugh. I can look out at the class, and the little girl I liked in that class, and she laughed too. It ruined me. It ruined me. And you go back, you're like, man. That was a lot of years ago. That was a lot of years ago. And I can remember it so clearly. So what do I do with that? Because it hurt and it's real. And that's the thing. Forgiveness isn't just the things where, you know, your DoorDash got your order wrong. Forgiveness is the things that changed who you are. 
we're forgiving things, big or little, DoorDash, getting it wrong, and the monumentally large ones. We're forgiving those, and we're remembering that we're forgiving, not because we're good at it, but we're doing so just as Christ did for us. We're forgiving them, and it, it's just hard. It's just work. It's just work. It's not pretty. It's not, it's not attractive work. It doesn't, it's not winsome. It's just grinding labor to say, I forgive you. I don't want to, but I will not hold this bitterness. I forgive you for what you did that hurt me. Insert their name. I forgive you for what you did that hurt me. And I think it's, it's, it's a mandatory part of the Christian life. Um, and it gets easier when you realize that his laughing at me, you know, is such a small thing. Though I was vulnerable and scared and embarrassed because I'm really bad at math. I mean, being a dyslexic, math was really hard for me. And I felt like I would, I would go into class just sick to my stomach. He'd put three problems on the board and he would call three students. I feel like I got called more than anybody. Hmm. Because he knew I would butcher it. And I'd be like, I don't know. It was like he was, I was a jokester. I was a kid who always made, you know, people laugh. I didn't always mean to or know I was going to make people laugh. I'd just make a comment. People would all laugh. I'm like, oh, so he probably has things I said that, um, <laughs> that he remembers. Mm-hmm. And he probably wants a piece of me too. Um, but the reality is um, my, my, my ability to hear his laughter at me and be so wounded and hurt and need to forgive that again so many years later. And I think that's just one chuckle. How many times have I dishonored God in my life? How many people have I laughed at that are made in the image of God in such a way that it caused them to feel devalued? And I can tell you, as a jokester, somebody who heckles, I mean, I, I'm heckling people all the time in the office. All, literally, all the time. I, it's, what, it's what we do. We just lace each other. It's super fun until it isn't. Sometimes you don't know you've hurt someone's feelings. How many times have I done that? How many times have I been the person in authority who's made a joke and it's really wounded someone? Um, when I begin to count up my sins, what I have to forgive begins to get less and less. Now, there are far more abusive people, far more abusive things that have happened to other people that are real. And they have to, forgiveness is a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking of that. That takes some real work. Forgiving this teacher, actually, when I put it in light of that scripture, it gets really easy. Mm. It gets really easy. Because he didn't do anything I haven't done a thousand times over. Right. Man, I, uh, yeah, that's, (laughs) I was like just thinking of like, okay, well, I have like this more, theological question, I suppose. We're shifting from like the more of the personal experiences that we've had. Um, and I can relate to that too. I can't, I can't think of any like immediately that come to my head because I just feel like if I'm asked a question like, hey, what do I think about this? Or like, what's the time that you blank? And I'm like, I need like an hour. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I, I just, I You'd don't have, have stuff to come to that me that quickly. Yeah. Um, but I did have a question. Um, there, I, would, I should say, there is a question. You hear from people who are skeptical just about mm-hmm. the faith of like, why can't God just forgive? Why can't God just freely forgive as like Jesus says we're supposed to? I'm just quoting them. Mm-hmm. And there was this, there was a movie I'd seen. Um, I know I've talked about it probably like once on this podcast. It's American Gospel. There's two of them. This was yeah. the second one. Um, and they're trying to answer that because there's a lot of people who are like, well, why? Why can't you, why can't God just forgive us? And it's like, well, okay. And I'll definitely ask what you think too, but it's like, why it, does that, that so devalues what Jesus did on the cross too. Like that's the cost of forgiveness right there. And when they say like, yeah, but you have to go and forgive too. That's what Jesus says. And like, okay, well, one thing that the people in it, like the, the pastors or the, uh, the apologists and whatnot, they use the part of scripture of, you know, when, when somebody slaps you on the face, mm-hmm. turn to them your other cheek as well. Mm-hmm. 
more so to you are absorbing that um, that justice. I, I I guess I would say mm -hmm. is that if you if you would owe them a slap back, well then like boom, you repaid a slap with a slap. Good job. Um, but well, and that's were, the Old Testament ethic: an mm -hmm. eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Mm -hmm. Jesus was undoing that ethic. Mm -hmm. He was undoing that ethic, and in doing so, he was heaping shame. It was a cultural statement to do that. When, when Jesus said, if you are made to carry a person's bag for a mile, carry it then a second mile. Why did he say that? Because Roman law was that um, any soldier could give up his pack to a peasant of any kind in the empire, and they were mandated to carry it for the soldier for a mile, but no more. What was Jesus saying? Turn the ethic on its head. Not only do what they ask, but do even more so. Why? To expose the injustice. And so in a weird way, when Jesus says, when you get slapped, give him your other cheek, he's, it's not saying don't exact vengeance. What it's saying is reveal the shame of their own actions. You know, especially for us who are stand our ground kind of people, the idea of turning the other cheek is very countercultural. But we have to understand that the ethic of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is an Old Testament thing that Jesus fulfilled. He turned the other cheek, He bore in Himself all the wrath of God that was owed to us. So here's my thing. So let's go to the question, why can't God just forgive? The fact of the matter is, he did. He did just forgive. All sin, all sin is forgiven in Christ, period, eternally. The question is, will you receive it? And that's where it gets really dicey. Because if all sin is forgiven, the question is, Will you receive it? So if I have a brand new 2021 F-150 crew cab sitting out there running, I say, Kyle, your new truck's out there. We paid the taxes on it. It's licensed. It's gassed up. All you got to do is get in and drive it home from work. And you walk past it and get in your car and drive home. Whose fault is that? No, I, I want to know. Oh, mine, yeah. Yeah, it's yours. <laughs> it's your fault. The, the reality is you could say to me, but I didn't want a truck. Okay, fine. It doesn't change the gift. That is yours. And it's sitting there, and we will leave it sitting there in perpetuity. And we will make sure it's ready to go. And you can walk by it and get in your car and walk by it from your car to go to work and actually forget that it's there and believe there's no way that could ever be mine. There's no way it's that easy. And we can walk by the gift so often that it becomes nothing more than a planter box in our mind. And, and we just leave it sitting there. And then we go... And we complain about what we're driving. Oh, I just wish I could, you know, I wish I could have some peace in this life. What did Jesus say? In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome this world. Peace I give you, my peace I give to you. Well, yeah, we don't want, we don't want it on his terms. But we aren't the ones who had to forgive sin, God is. So he gets to make the rules, and the rules are this. Come as you are. Me, and that's the ethic we have here. Come as you are, meet God on his terms. Excuse me, not ours. So come here broken, sinful, living in sin, you're welcome to come to the foundry. My, my challenge to you will always be, if you remain in sin, willful and unrepentant, then you're not gonna like it here because we're never gonna make room for people to live in willful, unrepentant sin in this church. But if you come here and you don't know it's sin, you don't know the gift that's offered you, then once you receive the gift of salvation, you'll begin to live differently. And God will transform you. And that's really the thing when it comes to forgiveness and um, forgiving as freely as you were forgiven. Why couldn't God just forgive? He did. The question is, why won't we be remade into the image of the very Son of God? Because we're happy where we're at. 
if we're honest. And we think, well, I'm forgiven. Isn't that enough? And for some reason, God says, no, not in that miserable state you're in. Yes, you're forgiven, but I want to perfect you. I want to perfect you. So let's change the analogy a little bit. Let's pretend you're a 1970 Chevy Chevelle, rusted up, beat up, engines all broke down. And God buys you out of an old barn. Boom, sets you there. And you are now owned by a master craftsman. And he gets to work on you. Right? And by the end of it, he's transformed that old, beat up, rusted out Chevelle into cherry red, 454, blown out, big, not slicks on the back, but big tires that makes that <laughs> when it's driving. Big, beautiful thing. He's, he's restored it into its perfect state. What's the perfect state of humanity? Christ. What's our state? Broken, miserable, and kind of, oh. What he's doing is perfecting us. Why can't he just forgive? He did forgive, but he called us to something greater. We can't always see greater because culture is screaming what greater is at us all the time. Greater is money, greater is beauty, greater is all these things that it isn't. Those things all fade. What is God doing? He's restoring us into something that will never tarnish. So when people say, why can't God just forgive? Because he wants to restore us to perfection. And perfection is Jesus Christ. And he has literally invited us and filled us with his spirit to be made into the image of Jesus. Transformation, sanctification is the theological word. Transformation is a beautiful, painful problem. Um, promise of God in the life of the obedient Christian. God did just forgive, but he also went a step further. He did buy us back, but now he's restoring us, and we are going to be perfect. Perfect. We're going to be made into the very image of him who we love and confess Jesus Christ. So when I look at that question and people are like, why can't God just forgive? My thing would be like, why would you want to stop there? He wants to remake you to everything you were supposed to be. Mm. Your sinful nature, totally dead and gone. And your new righteous nature in Christ, totally perfected and remade. One day we will get there. God will fully restore us all, but we get to be in the process of it in the here and now. So to me, forgiveness is, is this beautiful opportunity of hope for transformation. He can change that which we couldn't, our nature. He forgave it, and now he's working out the new thing. Mm. You ought to put a picture of a beautiful red Chevy Chevelle up, 1970. <laughs> oh, oh, man, it's a pretty car. And they're, they're just, think of it, it's beautiful, right? You see those old restored cars, like, oh, man, it's back to its perfect state. How much more perfect when the work is inside and out of those of us who bear his image? Mm. That's how I'd answer it. Man. And I think one thing I would just add to it, Jesus set the model for forgiveness. If you want to hear about it, listen to the teaching from uh, February 7, but he set the model. He showed us what it was to forgive by doing it first in the most costly way. Mm. So, you know, he didn't ask us to do anything he didn't first do. And uh, there's a tremendous humility in Christ that um, he didn't have to do that, but he gave us a map. It's hard. It's not always easy, but it is wonderful. Mm. You know, it is wonderful. It's like climbing Everest. It's not easy. It's, it's devastating physically, but apparently when you're on that summit, it's wonderful. Mm. It's worth the climb. And I would say in, um, in Christ's heart and in Scripture, it was worth it. It was worth it to redeem us. And if it was worth it for the Son of God to descend to such painful realities and painful experience, it's worth, uh, worth it for us to do the same, trusting that the model will hold, that what happened to Jesus will happen in our life. We will be glorified. 
God will, God will remake us into the image of Jesus. So we're just following the example of him who we love. Mm. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Man, we had a, we unpacked the whole series <laughs> worth of stuff yeah, today. Yeah, that, so. that was pretty good. Yeah. Got it in two hours. It was a long podcast. Oh, yeah. It'll be good, though. Yeah. I, I may actually go back and tune in. I like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for people to hear huh. it, too. Man, then we got, we got a little bit till our next one. Mm-hmm. But I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. So Me too. And thanks for doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah be absolutely. Awesome. That's a good time. Yeah, and thanks for tuning in for all the people who give it yeah. a chance. And if you'd share it, that would be great because more people get a chance to connect with it. So share it, like it, throw it out on social media. Word. Even though I'm not on it. You know, I'm not <laughs> on social media anymore. No, I didn't. Yeah. Huh. I gave up Facebook. Oh, man. I wanted to yell at too many things, so I'm like, oh, you know man. what? That's why I just don't look at anything. Yeah. I look at Twitter. I have Twitter. I just check it for, like, news. I pretty much just follow, like, <laughs> pastors, theologians and yeah. stuff now. I have, like, some other little things, but yeah. So now I'm just kind of like, oh, okay, yeah. that's what's going on. It but. became a black hole of wasting time for me. I'm like, yeah. enough. So, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Going back to the 90s. Yeah, dude. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know. I found my space. Ah. You get what I did wow. there? Yeah. Bringing it back. No, then. I didn't find my space. I was saying, I, I, yeah. Anyways, uh, it's a bad joke. It was a no, it was a good joke, joke actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh man. Awesome. Anyway, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch us. Um, I pray that you would all get a lot out of it, and we can't wait to see you in the next one. See you then. See you then.